Coming up on DTNS, Niantic actually becomes a lot more like real augmented reality. HTC's former CEO makes a play for the killer VR app and why the media stars of the future will be famous to fewer people. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 26, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the ever-lit <laughs> forests of Finland, I'm Patrick Beige. <laughs> lit, but not on fire. Uh, and, uh, from some, uh, and I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, we were just talking <laughs> about, uh, uh, we were following up on the, the raging controversy over Patrick's accent, or lack of, uh, on Good Day Internet. Uh, you can hear that debate by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple has fixed a bug that saw many users see massive numbers of their iOS apps update over the weekend, sometimes 50 apps or even more. The apps were updating to the exact same build as was previously installed, which caused some heads to scratch. 9to5Mac speculated that the updates appeared to be a workaround to family sharing glitches that were preventing some apps for la from launching with a message that it was no longer shared. Users could fix the glitch, at least temporarily before it got fixed, uh, officially by deleting the app that wouldn't launch and then reinstalling it. And so it's now being fixed. Switzerland launched its uh, Swiss COVID contact tracing app, the first to launch using Apple and Google's Exposure Notification API. Swiss COVID is being piloted among hospitals, key workers, civil servants, and the army. Public availability is expected mid-June. Meanwhile, India announced it is it will release the source code of its uh, contact tracing app, which launched in early April. The Android app's source code will be published on GitHub. A bug bounty program for the app will also uh, was also announced. Chinese smartphone maker Realme announced the Realme X3 Super Zoom phone. Uh, and interestingly, it's going to launch in Spain and the UK first. Realme normally launches their phones in India. The X3 Super Zoom has a periscope telephoto lens for 5x zoom and 120 hertz refresh rate on an HD LCD screen. Pre-orders start today at 499 euros coming June 4th. Realme also announced a smartwatch, a TV, wireless earbuds, and a power bank, all of those coming to India in June. HP announced a new line of Elite Books running on Intel Core and AMD Ryzen Pro 4000 series processors. The 1030G7 and 1040G7 convertibles both have options for 5G data, and the 1040G7 claims 29 hours of battery life. Hmm. Google's support for Rich Communication Service, or RCS messaging, on Android will now come to all T-Mobile US Android users. T-Mobile offered RCS to some users, but on different standard than Google. T-Mobile is now adapting the Universal Profile 1.0 interconnect used by Google, which can work across networks. T-Mobile is part of the CCMI initiative, along with Verizon and AT&T, which announced plans for an RCS cross-carrier app last October. Facebook released a voice call app called Catchup. It's an experimental thing for coordinating calls of update friends. Uh, your contacts show a ready to talk icon when they're available, so you know it's time to start the call. And if you're late, uh, showing of in progress calls will let you join. Spotify has lifted the 10,000 song limit on the number of songs that you can save to your library. While Spotify has 50 million songs, up until now you had a limit on how many you could save to your music. Spotify previously resisted raising the limit because it said fewer than 1% of its customers even got to that limit. Individual playlists and the number of songs that you can download for offline listening are still limited to 10,000. Facebook's Libra wallet Calibra has been rebranded to Novi and has been redesigned as a standalone app with interoperability with Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Novi didn't give details on what standard transaction fees might be if this ever gets off the ground, and all Novi customers will need to be verified using a government-issued ID. Novi will now be operated by a new Facebook subsidiary called Novi Financial that will operate independently of the rest of Facebook. All right, let's talk a little bit more about reality, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> a form of reality that might be alternate. Uh, Niantic will add a new feature it calls reality blending to Pokemon Go next month. Uh, 
The augmented reality feature known as occlusion will let creatures hide partially or entirely behind real-world objects like trees and furniture. Niantic first demonstrated its occlusion technology with a Pikachu video almost two years ago. Pokemon Go is also getting crowdsourced mapping functions similar to Ingress's portal scanning. Pokemon Pokestop scanning will let max level players record a stream of images at Pokestops and gyms to help improve 3D maps. Niantic says faces and license plates are blurred and it does not store any personal data in connection to contributions. Niantic says the feature will come, to, will come first to Samsung Galaxy S9 and S10 devices, as well as the Google Pixel 3 and Pixel 4. So when Pokemon Go first launched, everybody called it augmented reality and people started to get, you know, upset that, well, it's not really augmented reality. It just superimposes a creature in the world. It doesn't really know where the where the location is. And slowly Niantic has been uh, improving that and adding more actual augmented reality functions. This would be the biggest step forward in that. Uh, it would be, be really fun uh, if, you know, your creatures are hiding behind a chair and you have to kind of move around uh, to find them. It, it makes makes the game more challenging. <laughs> I, I have to admit I'm not a big Pokemon Go uh, player, but my impression was that augmented reality was kind of a novelty uh, in the gameplay loop and people who were serious about playing it didn't really use it all that much. But uh, maybe this will change that, and maybe it won't. But it um, doesn't seem like it has a huge amount of gameplay value. I'm not a Pokemon Go player either at all. I was briefly, you know, kind of when a lot of people picked it up for a few months and then, and then put it back down. But it was cool, and it was fun. And the idea of this type of true augmented reality... Um, coming to apps that I would use. I mean, I'm not going to be like rearranging my home every day, but something where I might be able to mix and match something that's really in my living room with something that's virtually in my living room. And it would be a little bit more seamless than the kinds of tools I have for that now. I can see where gameplay is one aspect of this, but uh, just better AR apps in general are another. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting to see how different outlets chose to to slant this different ways. Uh, some focused on what we're focusing on here, the gameplay and the augmented reality uh, portion of it, and others focused solely on what you said about uh, letting people stream images and capture and improve the maps and any privacy implications that that may or may not have. Sounds like Niantic uh, addressed those privacy concerns in the announcement. Uh, the, so as long as they follow through on that, I guess it'll be fine. Well, future, future rather phones will get better battery life and more powerful CPUs and also GPUs. ARM, which licenses its designs to Qualcomm, Apple, Samsung, Huawei, you know, the big guys, announced the Cortex A78 CPU and the Mali G78 GPU. ARM says that the Cortex A78 CPU core design offers a 20% increase in sustained performance and stays within a one watt power budget. A new Cortex X custom program will let partners create their own specialized Cortex CPU. The Mali G78 GPU supports up to 24 cores for a promised 25% increase in graphics performance. I mean, it's ARM promising it, but, you know, it's good. ARM also announced the Ethos N78 Neural Processing Unit with up to 25% improved performance efficiency over the Ethos N77, its predecessor. Yeah, we don't usually get as much attention on the ARM updates, uh, but as, as phones are becoming the predominant computing device that people use, uh, it's people are paying more and more attention to that and, and wanting to know, like, you know, when these ARM designs show up in ships, which will probably be later this year, which means probably not till 2021 will you see a lot uh, of phones with chips on this ARM design. Uh, will I be getting better graphics? Will I be getting better CPU? Will I be getting uh, better battery life? So, so uh, a lot, a lot of good uh, claims, a lot of, a lot of good promises here uh, from, from these ARM designs. Uh, it'll be a while before we get to live with them ourselves. But I mean, 25% increase in graphics performance, I'm guessing, uh, compared to the previous generation of GPUs, it is pretty massive. And we're already getting some very impressive graphics on mobile platforms and ARM uh, MPUs, I guess, or CPUs and GPUs. This is a lot. And uh, we're getting this year a bump in graphical 
fidelity with the release of the new generation of consoles, which will allow PCs to then get a, uh, you know, to, to get into the race again, because the bar will have been raised for everyone. So PCs will increase their efforts, let's say. Um, but it seems like even with the power constraints of mobile platforms, uh, ARM is following through on graphics performance um, on mobile yeah, on mobile platforms, it's very impressive. And there's, uh, you know, aspects of this that will be interesting for those trying to use ARM designs and server chips as well uh, with that kind of, of performance update. That's, that's a really good point as well. All right. I pay attention to this one. Might end up not being anything, but it has the feelings to me of something notable that will look back and go, oh, I remember when that was new. Former HTC CEO Peter Chow's startup XR Space has unveiled its 5G-capable VR headset, the XR Space Mova. Now, the Mova itself as a piece of hardware is interesting. It's powered by Qualcomm Snapdragon 845 chipset, has a beefy six gigs of RAM, uh, which is a couple uh, more than what you get in the Oculus, 4,600 milliamp hour battery, 2880 by 1440 display panel with a 90 hertz refresh rate and 702 DPI pixel density. Nice display, but that's not what the field of view is, which makes me think it might not be that impressive. Uh, and it's meant to be controlled with hand hand tracking, though it will ship with a single controller. They have cameras on the front of the headset to do that hand tracking. Uh, and the hand tracking supposedly will enable things like shaking hands, giving high fives, you know, things you can't do in real life right now, uh, grabbing and throwing <laughs> objects. It can track enough of your legs too with those front facing cameras to let you play a simple soccer game as well as make your avatar full body. Remember we talked about the avatars being cut off at the waist in previous software we've talked about, not in the MOVA system. And here's MOVA's big differentiator. It's the social space. Manova, which hopefully they'll change that name, I think. Uh, you can meet people in Manova in private areas. Uh, you can watch videos, play mini games, all that kind of stuff. You can also space scan with your uh, with your camera, your actual room, and make that a virtual room in Manova. Uh, there's also public spaces, so parks, beaches, nightclubs, cinemas, uh, all those things that Neil Stevenson and other novels have promised. Uh, other public spaces will come from furniture stores, uh, realtors. They have Vogue and GQ uh, on board. They have a Taiwanese baseball team on board, so you can go to a virtual baseball game. Four institutes in Taiwan are on board to use Manova for remote learning. It's listed at $599, so not cheap, not ridiculous expensive, but not cheap by any stretch. And we'll come to Taiwan with Chunghua Telecom and Europe with Deutsche Telecom. We don't know when. The reason I think this is notable is that the hardware is nice. It's supposedly lighter uh, than, than the HTC Vive. But it's that focus on we want to get the social aspect of this right. And if they do, that's the big if. But if they do, I think that could be the thing that makes VR take off. Like, oh, I'm an avatar that feels like me and I can virtually get together with people in a way that feels more reality. That's been the promise of VR and it's always kind of fallen short. Yeah, I I am totally with you on that. With the Oculus Quest, which I'm I'm currently still in my review period for uh, my next live with it segment uh as much as i really like this and i know some other people who have quests or or who at least are into vr enough that they care what i have to say or you know want to hear my experiences it feels very solitary it's like okay i'm gonna go away from earth for a little while and do my thing and then come back and talk to whoever will listen about it with me or maybe nobody um and the idea that i would be going to hang out with real people that I know the way that social networks work now in some sort of, you know, um, reality that, that adds some more dimensions and some more games and makes, I don't know, the idea of a chat room different yet the same is really exciting. And I think that they're onto something with this. And the, the idea that the headset itself is lighter and thinner and, uh, and, and has nice specs does not hurt either. This is a pipe dream, and it will never work that way. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I think it's the kind of thing where with every new piece of technology, we try to imagine a replication of what we already know, but the actual use cases for the, this new technology are different 
from what we already know. And I don't think we'll find many examples of that reimagining um, actually working. I get mad second second life uh, vibes from this, which second life was super hyped, uh, got a lot of attention, a lot of investment from brands and, and companies but it was more hype than reality. People didn't use it in that way. And when the hype died, uh, it, it died with it. I'm also reminded of, <laughs> this is a little bit of a different topic, but when, when we first started getting uh, um, mechanical things at home, people thought that we would have uh, carrot graters at home to make uh, grated carrots and we do but more likely you will buy carrots already grated from the factory from the store and this is when you think about the use for new technology you think of it as in terms of what you already know i think this is what is happening there and uh, i don't know we'll see but it does i i, I would put my money on it not working out you're, you're right that that's always the hurdle. What gets you over the hurdle is enough people being interested in that possibly incorrect use, like Twitter. Twitter was meant to allow you to send short messages to each other over text message easier and share them with more people. That's not what we use it for, but enough people were interested and went through the gates that they started to figure out those other uses. And so that's what I'm curious if Manova can overcome, is to say, look, all these other things, Second Life, uh, Facebook, uh, social rooms, they're all weird. They all require uh, a little too much imagination. Whereas if they can nail the appeal of this, that will cause a lot more people to dive in and try it, with, in which case then they might find out the other uses. A lot of ifs, trust me. And you may be right, Patrick. That's a lot that's of too many, yeah. too many ifs. Uh, but it does, I don't know, it does have the flavor of something that's worth paying attention to and might have a better chance of overcoming those ifs than a lot of other things we've seen. Because they're paying attention to some of those barriers, like, yeah, but it's only half of me. Or the, yeah, but it doesn't feel like me. They're they're focusing on solving that problem. That's the right problem to try to solve, whether they solve it or not. That's, that's the question. Mm. I'll agree. I'll definitely agree that uh, this is how you find the actual use of the technology is by getting enough people to give it a try and see what works and what doesn't. Google has launched a limited pilot to use Google Assistant's voice match to secure restaurant orders and purchases that are made through Google Play. Users in the limited rollout will see the option in Google Assistant settings to confirm purchases with voice match. Google warns during setup that somebody with a similar voice or recording may be able to confirm purchases on the devices you're logged into. So it's well aware of the first thing that someone's going to say, this is a bad idea. Google told Android police that the feature has a limit on how much money can be spent as well. Yeah, this is a convenience, not security. This is like, ah, I'm so tired of having to say that pin every time or having to use something or having to go pick up my phone and, and press a thumbprint. I don't mind giving up a little security because I don't have an evil twin and nobody's breaking into my house to play recordings of me. I'm not worried about that. I just wanted to use my voice to confirm that it's me, not someone else in the household. So, I mean, I, I think that's what it's for. Is it, is it secure? No, it's not. Uh, but in some situations, convenience can trump security rationally. And I think that's what this is for. This reminds me of uh, contactless payments with credit cards, which uh, security minded people were going crazy about because of the security flaws. Uh, and I thought would be kind of a, a, you know, insignificant improvement. I can't live without it now. It is, well, maybe because of the pandemic, literally contactless is better. <laughs> yeah, right. But, <laughs> but uh, it's just so convenient. I don't mind uh, the security issue. And uh, this sounds a little bit like that. As long as you're aware, as long as you go in eyes wide open on sure. this stuff, I think it's fine. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. The New York Times' Ben Smith has an article called The New Model Media Star is Famous Only to You, to which I add mom. No, uh, it's 
focusing on a service called Cameo that lets you buy short custom videos from celebrities. So Smith himself used it to get retired New York Giants defensive lineman Leonard Marshall to convince his dad to stop taking the subway into Manhattan during the pandemic, 75 bucks. Got an Olympic triathlete to give his daughter a pep talk, 15 bucks. Uh, a message from a former Boston Red Sox manager for his boss cost 100 bucks, and he got Chuck Norris to make a joke that he put on Twitter for 230 bucks. Cameo is seeing a boom. During the lockdown, bookings have grown from 9,000 in early January to 70,000. And Ben Smith identifies this as part of a larger trend towards gig work for mid-level celebrities. Uh, Lee Jin, a former partner at the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, calls it the passion economy. So examples are small merchants on Shopify making cool things that are really popular to a certain set of people but would never play in massive chains of retail stores. Uh, instructors on Udemy finding a, a group of people passionate about the thing that they know how to teach, even if there's not a massive availability of it. Musicians on Patreon podcasters on Patreon, uh, writers with paid newsletters uh, on Substack. Uh, he cites Emily Aitken, former New Republic reporter, who's made $175,000 this year with just 2,500 subscribers. So Ben Smith goes through all of this. He talks about how these are people finding their niche. Maybe they were big celebrities that aren't as big anymore. Maybe they were never big celebrities, but they are celebrities within their expertise. Smith asks... Is this good news? The rise of these new companies could further shake our faltering institutions, splinter our fragmented media, and cement celebrity culture, or they could pay for a new wave of powerful independent voices and offer steady work for people doing valuable work. Now, Patrick, I know uh, you brought this into the show today. Uh, do, do you have a thought on how to answer Smith's question? Is this good news? Uh, I would say to his two uh, proposed scenarios, why not both? Uh, obviously, it seems like both are plausible, and I don't think um, it will have to choose. Uh, I will say, however, that the first part of his proposition is addressing uh, content and uh, the way fragmented media uh helps maybe disinformation and things like that. This is already happening. What is not happening as much or has only just started happening is people being able to uh, monetize a smaller audience. And of course, I think we are the forefront of this with uh, Patreon. But these are other ways, and, and Cameo is a really interesting one, um, of making that happen. So I think Overall, I would say it is a good thing because it enables uh, uh, the good content to be monetized through another way than just advertisements, which traditionally favors uh, uh, quantity, I would say, over quality. You know, Cameo I'm familiar with for a couple of years now because it happens to <laughs> be something that somebody secret, secret Santa to me um, a couple of years ago. Um, there was a particular <laughs> reality show, doesn't matter which one, uh, but uh, there was a certain person on this reality show who sent me uh, like a Merry Christmas note. And my friend paid for it on Cameo and I got it and I lost my mind. You know, I was like, how did you do this? This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You know, that was very ha-ha novelty kind of thing. I know that the kind of, uh, some celebrity that Sarah might care about for whatever reason, maybe it's silly, maybe it means something to me, but isn't necessarily a huge part of pop culture. This is perfect for that. There's also an element of, so the celebrities just kind of sitting around like waiting to get little gigs kind of thing. And <laughs> I think like, okay, well, if that were me, do I have a problem with it? Maybe not. It, it it depends on, you know, the kind of, uh, I don't know, your portrayal of yourself in the first place. So this whole idea of maybe somebody who's semi-retired or maybe in a sort of bridge area of their career where they're transitioning into other things, but people still really like them. I think that's great. I think that part is great. I also know that uh, there were a lot of Tiger King cameos that I saw recently and, you know, that was, it was what it was. 
I think initially it might seem a little bit demeaning uh, for someone who was a celebrity and maybe we're thinking of it as, you know, in terms of, oh, they were in a movie or they were on TV, which was, you know, so cool. Uh, and so right. it's like oh, right. now they have to sit around waiting for cameo orders to be paid like and they make. 50 bucks per message well first of all those messages take about two minutes to make 50 bucks for two minutes of your time isn't you know if you get right. a, 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 a dozen a day or you know whatever it's a good rate um and second of all it is the the article dives into that very well it is about uh, catering to smaller audiences and distributing the revenue uh, to people who didn't get it before. Because those semi-retired people, they were just sitting in their home, fading it to ignorance. And at least now they have, a, or maybe they would go to small conventions dedicated to what they were doing. Now they have another way of connecting with people Another way, which is not just Twitter, where people yell at everyone, but that gets monetized. I think that's uh, valuable. Yeah, because it's not that they're sitting around and they're like, Cameo, that's my new career. I'm just going to sit here until I get, get a request, right? This, this is a this is a part of what they do. I, I imagine Leonard Marshall, uh, defensive lineman, uh, doesn't get a lot of speaking engagements. Um, maybe he does, uh, but I'm, he's certainly not going to be in demand like a quarterback would have been. So this is nice supplemental income uh, for him. And, and puts him in touch with people who are like, yeah, I was a fan of that thing that not that many other people are a fan of, but me and my friend or me and my family are, uh, you know, and I can think of smaller TV shows where, you know, secondary characters, they, they, they have to work hard. They don't, they don't get to coast through like, like, you know, uh, like a Brad Pitt, uh, they, they have to keep finding work. And so a little bit of supplemental income like this works, but also it's not just TV and movie celebrities. It's also, you know, uh, Ben Thompson, Stratechery, uh, like being able to say like, look, I have a number of people who really like what I have to say uh, and are willing to pay me for it. Uh, and and I'm going to keep doing that really well. And and like this uh, woman, Emily Aiken, making uh, $175,000 a year from 2,500 subscribers. Now, you have to be talented and you have to cultivate that audience. Right. Uh, but but you don't have to be a, a hit TV show star to make that happen. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, Don't forget it, also that it, we uh, it, we offer voicemail uh, recordings of from Sarah, Roger, and and I on our well, Patreon. I was okay, so I was right? like, I, yeah. and that was the first thing that I thought of is, would I ever have an issue uh, getting you know some residual income, re residual income from something like this? Doing so, like if enough people were like, we really like your voicemails. Not that you guys wouldn't want it, but you know, again, if Tom and Roger and I do the, do this on occasion. I mean, what if? lots of people wanted it and you're like okay this is a thing people want this yeah. is something that i can give you if you feel good about it great well, i actually just just to finish up uh i actually used bonjoro which is an app that lets you send very short exactly similar but for free uh i was sending messages to every new patron i would get on the rendezvous tech i did it for a couple of months it was <laughs> uh, really fun i ended up being overwhelmed with the um pandemic when it started so so i stopped but it's so easy to do if the app is well done um and it's actually pretty fun and uh that is another way of connecting with your audiences which is valuable stealth well, dave in our twitch chat has the question that we will finish on can anyone get a cameo by cameo uh, the, mu the musical artist yes, word up but it costs infinite dollars <laughs> so that loop is broken. let us know if you get one i Pretty sure someone's already tried. Yes, but but please let us know. <laughs> that would be great. And my mind would be blown again. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. It's also a great place for people to connect with each other. Doesn't matter if you're a celebrity or not. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. We got a really, really, really nice email titled GDI Banter. Much appreciated. This came in from David, who said... I was having a really crappy day this weekend. I tuned in, admittedly, an archaic phrase. We know what you mean, though, David. To hear GDI from Friday, and it really lifted my spirits. Thank you. Hope you guys know you provide more than just tech news. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, glad to hear that. Very, very glad to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, everybody's got a bad day. So, hey, we're all in this together, right? Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Justin Zellers, Tim Deputy, and Tony Glass. 
Also, thanks to Patrick Beja. Patrick, it's been a crazy week for you. What's been going on? Insanity. That's what's been going on. Hey, you know what? You work from home, right? Probably, maybe, uh, you work from home. And if you do, you might have issues that you want solved uh, about working from home. You know who has been working for home, from home for a long time? Tom Merritt and myself. And wonderful coincidence, we have a new show about uh, how to better work from home and keep your sanity when you're doing so. What's the name of that show, you might ask? Work Insanity. It's a wonderful pun. I'm very proud of it. You can get the show on your podcast app. Just look for Work Insanity or uh, go to workinsanity.net. It will redirect you. Uh, 15 minutes every Monday. It's very quick. You can't really afford not to listen. So go check out Work Insanity. I 100% agree with everything Patrick just said. <laughs> Uh, no, it's really, really been fun uh, putting this together uh, with Patrick. And so I'm, I'm so proud to, that people get to actually see it at workinsanity.net. You can always support our show at any level at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. And uh, we appreciate you doing so. Uh, the, the advertising dollars out there aren't that great right now, but we don't care because we've got you. Appreciate that. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You got something on your mind? Send it there. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>